I am delighted to welcome John. I think we need to show our appreciation because John has travelled two and a half hours in, well, two and a half years almost years. to get here. And uh, it's great to have him with us. So let's, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Thank you. So, John, we, we, we do this with all of our speakers. We've had your third one. So we're getting towards the business end now, uh, and we want the best speakers to come in. And that, that's why you've you're, had them you're first. Third. That's yeah, good. Well, that's <laughs> it. You've, you've, had the, you've had these lesser ones first, and now we've got the main man now. Um, tell us a bit about yourself, John. Where you're from? What's your name? All that nonsense. Well, my name's John, John Hills, and uh, I grew up in Bromley, uh, not a million miles from here, actually, and uh, I went uh, to Spurgeon's College, this is really super crazy. Before that, I was a missionary in Zimbabwe, working with street children. I then ended up at Spurgeon's College, same place where Doug is now, uh, studied for uh, ministry, ended up in a place called Gorsley, ross on Wye, Herefordshire, and ministered mostly to sheep, I have to be honest, <laughs> over there. And then uh, God called me to Frinton on Sea, a place where Doug is from. And uh, I met. I'm, I'm, I'm from the rough side of the tracks. I'm from Clacton. True. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we had a wonderful time there in Frinton on Sea. And one of my best young people was a person called Charlie, uh, formerly Charlie Baines. And uh, she really grew up in, under my youth ministry. And then God called us back home to Bromley. And so I'm in a church now in Bromley again, serving on the West Wickham Croydon border of Bromley, and uh, it's a challenging place, really challenging place. Uh, we, we serve uh, a community of over 200,000 people, and in that 200,000 people, we have some of the poorest people in South London, so it's a real challenge. Let me pray for you, John, before you. you begin. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for John, Lord. I want to thank you for the many gifts that you have given him in order to equip him for his ministry, Lord. And I thank you for the, the journey that you have taken him on, Lord. And I just pray now as he as he brings us your word, that uh, our hearts would be open to what you have to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Well, good evening. It is really great to be here. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I'm immensely jealous of your building. It is a beautiful place. And not so much of your building, but of your location. Uh, it's fantastic. Overlooking, really, the whole of Canterbury. And what an incredible place for God to be at work. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 4, because I'm here tonight to talk about mission, mission, in a slightly different way, I suspect, to what you may have thought we would have talked about tonight when talking about mission. We're not really going to talk about evangelism in the traditional sense, but about the mission that God has sent each and every one of us on. Jesus said... As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. That is you. You have been sent by Jesus to be on mission. You are missionaries. You are missionaries here in Canterbury and beyond. And I just want us to take a look at uh, Luke chapter 4 tonight. So um, let's just read verse 14 to 21. It says this. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let me just pray. Lord, I thank you so much that this is your word, and it's alive. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open it up and show us new things about you and your kingdom and what it means in this place for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a guy was uh, working in a wood factory, and uh, he came out of the wood factory with a wheelbarrow with a couple of buckets in it with lids on top. 
And uh, the security guard said, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. What do you think you're doing? Where are you taking this stuff? And what is it anyway? He went, oh, it's just the sawdust off the floor. And he said, prove it. So he opened up the buckets, and sure enough, inside there was just, well, wood shavings. And so the security guard said, well, go on, then move on, move on. Well, this happened the next day. And the security guard said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Why are you doing this again? He said, it's the wood shavings I showed you yesterday. He went, oh, okay, move on, move on. Well, it happened day after day after day after day. And in the end, the security guard got very, very curious and very, very suspicious as he went, whoa, stop. He said, I don't trust you. There's something fishy going on here. He said, what is in this bucket? And he said, I've told you, it's wood shavings. And so he lifted up the top in the bucket and sure enough, there were wood shavings. And he said, no, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. There is something else going on here. What exactly are you doing? You tell me and I might just let you go. I might let you off. And he went, oh, okay then, I'll tell you the truth. I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> Do you know what? That little joke tells something of a deep meaning. We can be so preoccupied looking at the little things that we actually miss the big picture. Church is a brilliant example of that. We can be so preoccupied with choosing the right paint, although you've gone for white everywhere, so that was easy, and we can be so preoccupied with the kinds of worship songs that we have, by the kinds of seats that we sit on, that we can actually miss the big picture of what God has called the church to be, the hope of the world. That actually you, you have been chosen by God to be his plan A, B, C. There is no other plan. You are it. Now that seems to me a bit daft because I know me. I'm rubbish. Why would God choose me? But he has. He's chosen you to be his carriers of good news. In fact, he wants you to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to the world in which we live. You have been chosen to continue the ministry that Jesus started here on earth. Uh, Luke chapter 4 really is Jesus' manifesto. This is Jesus saying, this is why I've come and this is what I'm going to be doing. This is why I've come and this is what I'm going to be doing. And of course we know in the life and the ministry of Jesus, this is exactly what he did. Proclaiming good news. Proclaiming good news to the poor, to the broken hearted, to the imprisoned, to the blind and to the oppressed. And on the day of Pentecost, God anointed the church with the same power that he gave to Jesus when the Spirit rested on him. The day of Pentecost, when the church was born, God came and gave the power to the church to continue the ministry of Jesus. Do you know, they were told by Jesus to wait. I want you to wait on me, and I will send the power for you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. You are to wait and to pray. I wonder, when was the last time you waited on God and prayed? And didn't move until you'd heard what he had asked you to do? It's hard, isn't it? Really hard to do that. I don't know how they did that for so long, just waiting there in the upper room. But when that day came, boom, the Spirit came, and it changed everything. They poured out of that upper room, filled with the Spirit, and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And they did miraculous signs and wonders, and everyone was in awe of the church. Our Canterbury in awe of Canterbury Baptist Church. You know, this isn't the exception. God actually wants it to be the rule. That Pentecost should be happening day in, day out, in our own personal lives and in the life of our corporate churches. We should be so filled with the Spirit that we are genuinely attractive to those who don't believe. Wow. I don't know about me. I don't think I'm genuinely attractive in any sense whatsoever, let alone spiritually. That's a real challenge. We need to wait daily. On the spirit. When we get up in the morning, what's the first thing that runs through your mind? For me, it's get out of the house. I'm late. I've got to get dressed and got washed, get the kids out, get them dressed and washed. You know, I've got to get my wife dressed and washed. I've got to get everyone out of the house. My first thought is not to wait and to pray. 
But you know, each and every day, there's wonderful opportunities that God has placed in front of us to do the work and the ministry of Jesus as laid out in Luke chapter 4. He really wants us to ask him for those divine appointments, those divine opportunities in our daily lives. So what is the ministry that Jesus wants us to fulfill? What is the mission that Jesus is sending us on? Let's just take a look through this passage of Luke chapter 4. The first is to preach good news to the poor. To the poor. Jesus said, the poor you will always have. And that is true. We don't need to look very far to see the poor, whether it's in our newspapers, on our TV screens, in our own community. The poor are all around us. And there are three types of poverty. There's physical poverty. You know, the kind of poverty that today restricts people to £1.50 earning per day. Half of the world live on £1.50 a day. Half of the world on £1.50 per day. Actually, there are a third of people living in the world today that only earn 40p per day. Just put your hand in your pocket for me. Have you got any change in your pockets? Got any change in your pockets? Got any change in your purses, in your wallets, in your bags? Because if you have... You are part of the top five richest people in the world. Yes. But no. That's, that's mad, isn't it? That actually so many people in our world today live on such low earnings and in such poverty. Um, today, we learned the Trussell Trust who run food banks. They run a food bank here in Canterbury. Some of you may be involved in that. The church may be involved in that. Are you involved in the church? Fantastic. They fed 913,000 people last year. Trussell Food Bank. And that's just Trussell Trust, let alone all the other food banks and pantries operating around our country. Through the years of austerity, the poor have actually got poorer, and the top rich have got a lot richer. The gap has hugely increased. The poor are all around us. Here in Canterbury, I don't know whether you knew this, but um, the Citizens Advice Bureau describe child poverty on near Dickensian scale. One in seven children here in your community live in poverty. One in seven. That that should make you mad. You should be angry about that. That is not right. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to change that? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you to do that work. He's actually anointed you to be about preaching good news to the poor, which means alleviating poverty, that they might see there's a God in heaven who loves them. I don't think it's only uh, physical poverty, though. It's moral poverty in our communities today. There's a genuine lack of understanding of what's right and wrong. A genuine misunderstanding about what would be the right thing to do and what would be the wrong thing to do, because there are now so many levels of grey. Now, people are not sure about what is definitively right and what is definitively wrong. We have, in our possession, God's Word, which is the definitive answer. The definitive answer. And and we have been anointed to contextualize God's Word, which was written hundreds and thousands of years ago, into today's culture. Karl Barth, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, said, that he always read his Bible in one hand with a newspaper in the other. We should be reading our Bibles in one hand and our iPads in the other. We should know what's going on in our world, what's happening in our culture. We should know what people are struggling to understand so that we can bring good news to those who are poor in their moral decision-making. Now that means that we need to let the world know what we are for and not so much what we're always against. Because the church is brilliant at telling people what we're against, aren't we? We must seem like the most negative people in the world. So boring to listen to. Always nagging and moaning. A bit like me grandmother. But we're meant to be people. We're meant to be people that share the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. And that means teaching God's word into the context that we've been placed. What does that look like here in Canterbury? You've got... 17 odd thousand students on your doorstep from all around the world. What an incredible opportunity. You've got the student union bar next door. Why are we not there tonight? 
Then, of course, there's spiritual poverty, where so many in our world today, so many in your community, lack a spiritual connection with our Father in heaven, have no concept of being loved by the Father, have no idea what it is to have real meaning and purpose living within them by the power of the Spirit. And understand that Christ came, that they might be saved. There's a spiritual poverty that we have been anointed with the power of the Spirit to bring good news to. To bring good news to. Secondly, Jesus says, I have come for the brokenhearted. Those who live with disappointment, maybe failures. Those who have family troubles, work issues, personal failures. Those who are deeply hurt by what's happened in their past. Those who have been rejected, cast out, downtrodden. Those that have built up resentments and now full of bitterness. Do you know people like that? Our communities are full of people who are broken hearted. God made a promise to Isaiah, I will not break. I will not break the bruised reed. And I will not snuff out the smoldering wick. God loves the broken hearted and so should we. And our ministry, we've been anointed to be modelled by Jesus to be about binding up the broken hearted. Jesus came for the imprisoned, literally the prisoner. I know that you did have a prison once, didn't you? It's gone. Is it gone? It's gone. But we can, when we meet prisoners, not only prisoners inside a jail, but those who are prisoners to addictions, drink, drugs, pornography, those who are prisoners to secrets. You know, all of us hold secrets. Some hold secrets that are genuinely ruining their lives, imprisoning them, that they can't get past. Maybe it's guilt, maybe it's family secrets. Some are held back by fears that cripple their daily living. Do you know people like that? Jesus said, I have come to set them free. And so is the church. That is their job, to bring freedom to the prisoner. Jesus came for the blind, the literally blind, the literally blind, physical blindness. 11,500 people registered blind in Kent. That stretches from my neck of the woods, Bromley, all the way down to Dover. 11,500 people. We should take that seriously. That's a mission ground to reach those. Jesus did. Jesus healed the blind. Is this church healing the blind? Is this church seeking to reach the blind? Are we seeking seriously to reach people with disabilities? That's where Jesus was found. And so should we be found there with love and compassion as Jesus had. We need to take that seriously. There's relational blindness. You know, I, I, I've been a youth minister, I've been a children's minister, and the one thing I notice time and time again is relational blindness. Not understanding relational boundaries. Not getting how relationships work. And many of young people grow into adulthood still with that relational blindness. Divorce is on the increase, by the way, not on the decrease. Then there's spiritual blindness. Living in darkness. Most of our community not knowing the truth about Christ and his love for them. And then lastly, Jesus came for the oppressed. These are the kicked around, the downtrodden. Of course, there's politically oppressed people. BBC said that there were 100,000 Christians martyred for their faith last year. 100,000. Can you get your head around that? 100,000 people. That is most of this community here, martyred for their faith in Christ. I wonder, are we indignant about that? Do we care about that? Does that have any motivation in our daily living to care about those who are literally dying for Christ? Today, in our world, there are more slaves than any time in history. Did you know that? More time. More slaves than any time in history. When the abolition of slavery came in, back in whenever it was, 17 whatever, whatever, William Wilberforce saw they had done a great job. And they had. Where are the William Wilberforces today? Is there a William Wilberforce here in this room that is prepared to stand up for those who are being trafficked, mostly for sex? Children that are growing up in brothels with a complete loss of innocence. Jesus' ministry was to set the oppressed free, and so is the church's. That means you. 
and me. Last summer, a couple were jailed in Canterbury Crown Court for the smuggling of sex slaves. It's happening here. It's happening on your doorstep. It's happening on my doorstep, in my backyard. There are brothels everywhere. What are we doing to rescue women from sex slavery? Then there's the culturally oppressed. Women, children, those around the world for their sexuality, people genuinely fearing for their life for cultural oppression. And of course, spiritual oppression. Many people caught up in spiritual things that they have no real understanding of. And Christians who are spiritually oppressed. Maybe some of you here. Paul said, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities. Do you believe that? I I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be so blasé. You know, I just go through my day not recognizing and realizing the temptations that are in front of me have been placed there by Satan himself, by his demons, to trip me up. We we are on the good side. We have victory in Christ, but there is an enemy. Let's not sleepwalk through our day not thinking that there is a lion-like person that seeks to devour us. In fact, until recently, I got a bit scared by that, you know, this scary lion around the corner ready to devour and eat me. You know, that is re- said in Peter, he's like a lion. And someone said to me, but John, that's the point. He's like a lion. He's not a lion. He is not the victor. He hasn't had victory. He is defeated. He is like a lion. There is only one lion, and that's Jesus, the lion of Judah. So whose side are you on? I went, oh, you're preaching to me. And it worked, because we are on the victory side. But there is spiritual oppression. And some of you here right now may be going through a period of genuine spiritual oppression. Maybe you're losing faith. Maybe you're struggling to connect with your Father in heaven. We need to take that seriously. Jesus said, I've come that you might be free. That you might have freedom to live life in all its fullness. In all its fullness. Jesus actually said, I've come to bring you jubilee. Jubilee was a big deal back in Jesus' day because jubilee literally meant freedom in all its senses. It meant that on the 70th year, every slave should be set free. Every debt should be written off. And all land should go back to the original owner. That's a fantastic idea. And guess what? It was God's idea, and it was a command. And do you know what? Israel fulfilled that command Not once. Not once did they do what God had asked them to do. But Jesus came and fulfilled it in its fullness so that all who are found in Christ are free, are free indeed. That's the ministry of Jesus. And that's the ministry of the church to proclaim that freedom to the world in which we live today. And the communities and the people that we rub shoulders with in the coffee shops, in the pubs, in the student unions, wherever we find ourselves, we're there to proclaim jubilee, freedom for people who are without Christ. This is what Jesus said in John 13. I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done to you. The manifesto that Jesus claimed to be his, he passes on to you. So how are you doing with that manifesto? How's it going? How's it happening? What's it looking like in this context here in Canterbury? What does announcing the Lord's favour, forgiveness, freedom, life look like here? It means that we need to preach the good news. This is uh, not really a place for the well. This is a place for the sick. This is a hospital. If you've come here hoping that you would be on a cruise liner enjoying the wonderful Beautiful entertainment, lovely food, waiter service. You've probably come to the wrong place because this is a lifeboat. This is a rescue ship for the lost and the drowning in this community. That's church. Church, unfortunately, has become the cruise liner. But that's not the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is to rescue the lost. In fact, Jesus has never said it. I've come to seek and save the lost. And so we need to do that. 
That means not only being in this building, but being out there in the real world, seeking people who are poor, who are oppressed, who are prisoners, who are brokenhearted, who are blind. And it means we must proclaim the gospel. The gospel is foolishness to our world. Do you know that? They don't get it at all. It seems so ridiculous. Jesus died on the cross. What a loser. Why did he do that? That was a stupid thing to do. If he's God, why did he let himself do that? I get that all the time. All the time. We've, uh, we've got this um, huge, expansive window at the front of our church. And uh, it really is the entrance hall to our church. And so it had filled up with junk because that's where everyone put their junk on a Sunday morning and then forgot to take it home with them. So there were umbrellas there from the 1970s, and there were Billy Graham things there from 1942. There was all kinds of junk piling up in this room. And so when people walked past our church, and hundreds do every single day, when they walked past, all they ever saw was a church that was dead, and literally back in the 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s. They didn't see life at all. And so um, someone had a vision to change that place into a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week prayer room. And so that's what it is today. They cleared out all the junk, and then they felt a bit uncomfortable because these hundreds of people walking past were looking in the window going, hi, and they were a bit embarrassed by that. And so they decided to put stuff up on the windows. And they thought, we've got this massive window, what should we do? And so they decided to put up the story of the lost son. It goes right the way through our, building, uh, through our windows, start to finish. And at the end, it says, welcome to the party. Come and join us. And we've had people walking past, taking pictures of this window. It's gone in the local rag. People are literally stopping and looking and reading the story. And there at the end, seeing, welcome home. Come to the party. We've had people knocking on the window, saying, can you tell us about this story? The day it went up, the guy that put it up, the, desi the designer guy, graphic designer, as he was putting it up on the thing, he said, can you just tell me, what does the story actually mean? And I went, sit down. <laughs> we need to proclaim the good news in the context that we've been placed. You've got so many contexts going on here in Canterbury, it's difficult to know where to start with proclaiming. But each and every one of us need to proclaim daily through our testimony, through simple words that we speak to people. We do need to speak out. We should be running Alpha or an equivalent so that when we feel a bit nervous about sharing about Christ, we can at least invite someone and say, come and see, come and see the person that changed my life. But then we also need to demonstrate it. As I've said, we've gone through, we need to demonstrate the good news. Um, and that can happen in our everyday living, through the ordinary things. In fact, it's better if it does. Really good if it happens for our ordinary living. I heard a story about a guy who bought a brand new Volvo XC90. Lovely, lovely car. And he had it equipped with everything inside. You know, it was beautiful. It had 19-inch alloys put on it. It was a smashing Volvo. If you can have a good Volvo, that was a good Volvo. And, and he polished it every single day. Made sure it was absolutely spotless. And one day he was out there cleaning his car and his neighbour was on his phone, sort of shouting his phone, saying, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it's not working. And after the phone had gone down, he said, well, you're okay, what's, what's wrong? He said, my car, my car has broken down and we're going on holiday tomorrow. Two weeks around the whole of Europe. And we've really been looking forward to this. And without thinking, the man put his hand into his pocket, took out his keys and gave his next door neighbour his Volvo keys. And the man looked at him and he went, what are you doing? He said, take it, take my car. And he went, really? He went, yeah, yeah, take it, you can have it. You can borrow it. So 4 a.m., this man was woken up and he looked out the window and there was his car with like 30 kids getting in the back and they all drove off around Europe. Two weeks later, they came back, 4,000 miles later. 4,000 miles later. He pulled up, and it was filthy dirty, and handed the keys back to this guy. And he said, thank you so much. We have had the best holiday ever. We enjoyed it so much. It was everything we thought it would be. Thank you so much. He started to walk away, and he went, there is one thing. In these two weeks, I've got to be honest, the one thing that's been going over and over and over in my mind is, why would you do that? 
Why would you do that? And again, without even thinking, the guy said, because it doesn't belong to me, God gave it to me. And what is mine, he asked me to share, because it was given by him. And the guy went, oh. And as he began to walk away again, he went back into his house. He dwelt on that thought. A few weeks later, the guy knocked on his door and he said, excuse me, he said, we've just got this at my church that we go to, and it's a, it's a leaflet about a course called Alpha. And I just wondered, would you like to come and meet the God who's given me everything so that I can share it? And the guy goes, yeah, I guess I will. Three weeks into the Alpha course, he was saved and baptized. By the end of the Alpha course, all of his family had been saved and were now part of the church. All because he gave his keys. What a simple story. We can demonstrate the gospel in all manner of ways. Maybe we just need to wake up tomorrow morning and say, Lord, would you give me that divine opportunity, that divine appointment, and please give me the courage to act on it. Would you have given your Volvo away for two weeks? What an outcome, though, of that true story. We're there to preach the good news as church and as individuals. We're there to heal the brokenhearted. If if we have to ask who the brokenhearted are, then we've not got our eyes open because they're all around us. Right now, in this room, there are plenty of you who are brokenhearted. You're hurting because of things that have happened in your life, because of things that are happening in your family. There is genuine pain. And if we can't see that in other people, we're going too fast. We're living life too fast. If we can't see the hurting around us, God might be saying, you need to slow down and have eyes to see and a heart that beats rather than just cold and for yourself. That challenged me. That do we see the brokenhearted that God's placed around us? Again, maybe we could wake up tomorrow and say, Lord, would you show me someone who's brokenhearted today that I might bring healing? Maybe just by a listening ear, a thoughtful word, by a caring touch, by saying that we'd pray. We need to bring freedom for the prisoner, giving hope to those with addictions. You've got an amazing building. I also noticed on the front of your building, you've got a sign that says hub. That's true, isn't it? Hub. This is a hub. Is this the hub of the community where the brokenhearted and the imprisoned can find freedom and hope? I hope and pray that is so. I hope and pray that those who have addictions, those who have secrets, those who have fears, find genuine place of sanctuary and refuge in this place. That's what a hub is truly about. We need to help people recover their sight. We need to pray for the sick. We need to ask for God's healing in people's lives. They are being hurt by sickness. Do you believe that God heals today? Let's pray for it then. You know, we get embarrassed, don't we? He might not do it. He might not do it, so I'm not going to pray for it. What if he doesn't do it? Well, I'll I'll go, Lord, if it's your will, if it's your will, that's what I'll pray. Well, let's just pray for healing and let 